circumcision is what we're talking about. And, uh, but we talking, last week we called it the importance of circumcision. And uh, joked about a little bit about uh, just that unusual thing that's in the Bible, how important circumcision is. But uh, uh, we're, we're going to talk about it again. We didn't quite finish last week. I told you to turn to a couple passages and realize, well, no, I'm not going to finish. And the finish is really important because it's going to show the difference of what was what God was doing through Israel and what God is doing today. So we're going to go back to that subject. And uh, so we'll start back here, just kind of a quick introduction to Genesis 12. We're studying salvation. But you know, when I do this, in my own mind, I, ha I always stop before, you know, I have all kinds of things prepared to say, and then I have to ask myself, well, what, what's the importance in what you're saying? And not, not just that it's true, I mean, that is important just by itself. Uh, but, but we're talking about the gospel of salvation, and, and we're, ta we're studying, we call it the technical term soteriology, but the, the gospel of salvation from sin, and how God from the very beginning hath dealt with man and made a promise from the very beginning when man sinned that God would pro provide salvation. And, uh, and as you go back in the Old Testament, you see the means by which God is bringing that salvation about we know today that that salvation is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It all culminates in Jesus Christ coming in His first coming to die on the cross, and on that cross He paid for our sins. And then He rose again from the dead victorious over sin and over the grave and over hell and death, and offers to us eternal life as a free gift because if He's paid for our sins, they're paid. And now it's God's means by His grace, uh, through His grace, to offer us salvation uh, as a free gift. And, uh, and we know that now because we live in the, in the time after Christ has come, died, and rose again, and the truth of what He accomplished in His death, burial, and resurrection has been revealed. But as we're going through the Bible, we're watching the progression of salvation and how God uh, revealed His salvation to mankind, and, and actually is trying to understand how these early men thought of salvation. So as we're going through that, it's good for you to know those things. Uh, but it's certainly good to, for you to understand how God brought about the salvation that He promised when you start talking about the importance of those things. And, uh, and, and, and so when we study this, you couldn't really study anything more important. And then to bring up, here we go, back to the subject of circumcision uh, and, and wonder why in the world that is so important. Well, it's not my fault that God made it so important and covered from Genesis 12 to Acts chapter, 9, uh, chapter 15, just loaded with the importance of circumcision. It's not me repeating it. It's God's Word, how important all through God's Word up until the calling and commissioning of the Apostle Paul, it was extremely important for a person's salvation. And uh, I say my fault, that's not that you're blaming me for anything. What I mean is, uh, I don't know that anyone stresses it that much, but the Bible stresses it extremely. We were looking last time, well first let me read the verses. Genesis chapter 12, and God, God singled out after he took the Gentile nations, nations and cut himself off from them. And left them to their own sins and idolatry, called out of Abr called Abram out of uh, the land of the Chaldees, and made a covenant with Abram, who becomes Abraham. And he says in Genesis 12 and verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It's extremely important for me to first to, for you to know that God took from Abram and is going to make out of him a great nation. The nation of Israel is not a nation that God just chose. It's a nation that God made. He created him out of, them out of Abraham. That's the importance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's name being changed to Israel, and him having 12 sons that become the 12, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. But, but it's also important for you to know that God's going to bless them and make them great because it's through, through this promise to Abraham that God is going to curse, bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And then that ultimate statement, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What God singled out Abraham to do and to, to make this nation out of him is the means by which God is going to bring salvation back to the nations. The nations, the Gentiles, we all turn to idolatry. And God is going to make the nation of Israel, and they're going to be His testimony nation. They're going to be the nation that they, God belongs to them, and they belong to God, and God's going to bless them in such a way that all the other nations are going to know, you know, the God of Israel, He's real. 
Ours is stone and wood. Ours is make-believe. But the God of Israel is the true God, and then through the nation of Israel, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And then you come over to Genesis 17. God reiterates that promise, calls him from Abram, to, calls his now name Abraham, but he says in verse 9 of Genesis 17, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. This, this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And he reiterates how it's got to be the eighth day and so forth. He says in verse 13, He that is born in thy house, he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh. Now that's important for you to realize. It's going to be in, in their flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Well, to be cut off from, from his people, the end of verse eight, verse 8 says, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land where thou art stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. If you get cut off from those people, God's not your God, is he? So you're talking about being cut off from God, the eternal God, the God who's going to provide life. And so when God makes this covenant to Abraham, it's so important that not only every one of his seed, but if you're going to be associated with the nation of Israel, if you're going to be a servant or just live among them, that you be circumcised. And anybody who refuses to be that is going to be cut off from God's people. You're not his people. So circumcision was extremely important, was it not? Now we started going through the Bible last week realizing how at different points circumcision pops up as an issue that shows how important it is. And, uh, and we, we kind of ran out of time looking at some Old Testament evidences of that. Uh, but before I ask you to f turn to 1 Samuel, I, I want to have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Uh, our God and our Father, I, I just do ask that you guide my mind and certainly my mouth. And uh, let the words of the page of Scripture teach us what you were doing through the nation of Israel and what you will accomplish. And help us to see perhaps something new. Help us to understand your grace to us. And help us to rejoice in that grace and salvation you've given us through Christ. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, turn with me to 1 Samuel. Say first, I've got to double check that. Yes, chapter 17. Now, we've already looked at several, and this will be the last one from, the, from this part of the Old Testament. But just, it just pops in here, and if, if you didn't know what this covenant to Abraham, what God is doing with the nation of Israel, why God chose them out and created them, called, chose Abraham out and created a nation from him, and, and gave blessings and promises to the nation of Israel, you wouldn't know what your whole Bible is all about, especially your Old Testament and, and most of your New Testament. Um, but now that we've gone back and gotten that foundation, th th this is the, the popular so-called story of David and Goliath. This is a time in which Israel is, they're in the land, but they're still Gentile nations that don't want to give up that land to Israel. And the Philistines are part of that group of people. And uh, there, there's wars just going on all the time because when God sent Israel in to take the land, they didn't take it fully. And as a result of that, there's still Gentiles in the land, always challenging for the land that God promised them. And ultimately, God will give them that land. But back here in 1 Samuel, as David is just a young man, he's probably about 14 years of age. He's not out to war, but Israel's out to war, and his older brothers are out in war. And his dad sends him to find out how the war is going and to bring food to his brother. Now, you know, they didn't, you know, people had to supply the needs. Uh, can you imagine if you went to war, you'd have to. Did you, ever see, did you ever see the Beverly Hillbillies where Jethro was going to join the Marines? So they bought him a tank. You know, not that the government don't supply it. You go out with your own stuff. Well, that makes me think of here. These people are out to war, but they're waiting for mom and dad to bring food from home so they can eat. You know, it's not like government rations they have. So anyhow, they're, they're out to war, and David's going to come. But why they're out there, uh, it says over in verse oh, 04 of it says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. 
Now, a cubit is 18 inches, and a span is the length of your hand spread out, so it's about 6 inches. So that when you figure out how large this man is and do the calculations, it comes out exactly in inches that he's uh, 9 foot 6 inches tall. Uh, just the reading of verse 3 and the, uh, verse 4, uh, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines. I mean, he's their champion. And, and what he's proposing to do when he comes out is he comes out and he says, hey, there's no need for two nations to get together and fight. Uh, I'm here. You send out your best man and let us fight it out. If he wins, we'll surrender to you. If I win, you surrender to us and, uh, and the war will be over. And uh, everyone in Israel just shaking in their boots. A nine foot six inch tall giant. I mean, this guy's huge. When it starts talking about uh, his height and all, verse 5 it says, And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. And you're going to be tough penetrating that head. And, and, his arm, uh, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of, of the coat was 5,000 talents, uh, uh, shing, uh, shekels of brass. That's 156 pounds. That metal, that you know, chain that's going to protect him from a sword piercing him, he puts on that coat that, that has all those chains so that when you try to drab a, dry a, draw a sword into him, you can't penetrate it. His coat weighs 156 pounds. Look down in verse 7, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, so it's real thick. Uh, I'm not sure how thick, but his, the, head, uh, uh, his, the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one, and one bared the, the shield went before him. So the head of his spear was 20 pounds, and, and the shaft is like a weaver's beam. Man, that... You get pierced with that thing, you're gone, even if it don't hit you in a vital spot. So this man comes out, he's got his armor bearer standing in front of him, holding a shield, and he's standing there with that spear and all, all his warfare saying, he's the champion of the Philistines, Israel, send out a man. And, and they're just all cowering, nothing's being done. Down in verse, uh, by the way, uh, Pete was telling me they're studying this in his class, I never even thought the, the similarity of this. If you study their, their king right now is Saul. The reason he's king, he's a foot, he's a head taller than every, head and shoulder or something like that, taller than every man in Israel. You don't see him going out there to fight Goliath. <laughs> he might be seven foot or six foot something, but he's not going up against nine foot six inches, and this man wasn't skinny out there either. And uh, so anyhow, David comes and, and he's giving the, the food, and he sees this champion come out and stand there, and it says down in verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by uh, him, saying, What shall be done unto the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? What kind of reward is the king offering? He says, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, you know, David understood Israel's blessed position before God. I mean, Goliath might be big, right? Is he bigger than God? And Israel belongs to God, right? Now, if you believe that, that God is on your side, then what? this guy is an uncircumcised Philistine. You see why uncircumcision is important there? Or why circumcision is important? David's of the circumcision. He's of the seed of Abraham. He is God's people. And here this uncircumcised nine foot, six foot, uh, nine foot, six inch tall guy stands out there thinking he can defy the armies of the living God. He don't have a chance. David's 14 years old. They try to put the armor of Saul on David. He, he's all bogged down. He says, forget this. He's a shepherd. He guards sheep. He takes five stones out of the ground. Interestingly, Goliath had four brothers. That's interesting. He takes five stones out and he goes out to Goliath and, and he sw swirls the stone. Was it in verse 26? Uh, verse 40, he takes the five smooth stones and drew near unto the Philistine. And anyhow, he, he takes the stone, he throws it, and, and, and it hits Goliath in the temple, and Goliath goes down flat, and, and David goes and chops off his head and delivers it to the king. The Philistines, they take off for the hills. <laughs> they lost their champion. And, and Israel then gets bold, and they go chasing the Philistines in war. And God brought victory through this David standing up to this man. Look at, look at verse 45. It says, And David said to the Philistine that cometh to, uh, 
and, and you know, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom, I, uh, whom thou defile. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and will take thy head from thee, and will give it to give the carcasses uh, 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 of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all that uh, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. But the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it unto your, uh, into our hands. You, you see, David understood everything. David understood he's not about to go on there in his own power and defeat Goliath. He understood that God stood with Israel, and that this man didn't stand a chance, and he said, I'm going to destroy you. But notice the two things there, that when he does this, all the earth might know that there's a God in Israel. There isn't a God anywhere else. There's a gods, there's idols everywhere else, but they're not real. There's only one real God, one true and living God that this Philistine thinks he can defy. And he's going to learn he can't. And when David defeats him, it's not going to be with sword and spear. It's going to be in the name of the Lord. And the Lord is going to deliver David and the, the armies of Israel. You know, the, the second point of that, not only do you see God using Israel as a testimony nation a testimony to the uncircumcised that the circumcision is where God's at and salvation is through God's program with the nation of Israel. But he's also, there's a demonstration there that even Israel ought to know it's not their works that saves them. It's not their strength, not their ability, not their greatness. It's God's promises to them that bring salvation. In the Old Testament, God does require people to do things. But the issue with God the thing that's, that's always the point is the heart of faith toward what God said. David just believes the promises that God made. God is going to bring the salvation. And so even though men in the Old Testament did things that God told them to do because faith does what God said to do, they understood salvation is from God. God's the one who promised salvation. And that back here, salvation is going to be through the nation of Israel. Through the nation of Israel, the covenant that God made with Abraham, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Now come over with me to another book of the Old Testament, Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is under the law before the new covenant that God provides for the nation of Israel and before the age of grace in which we live in today. We don't call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Old Testament, but they are as far as God's program with Israel under the law is concerned. But w watch this, because, you know, back, I, I, I tell people all the time, I went to Bible college and they did their best to teach me God's Word, but they left out some major things by just teaching me stories and teaching me some doctrines, but not teaching me how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Uh, here's a passage of Scripture I never understood. You'll hear it misused constantly in a very lovely way, by the way, but misused. Uh, but in Matthew chapter 24 is about the second coming. I got, no, I want you in 25. <laughs> Matthew 24 is about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to judge within the nation of Israel and reward his faithful servants within that nation. But in Matthew 25, in verse 31, Jesus Christ, he's already come back, judged his nation, and now there's a judgment of all nations. And look what it says in verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations. Now see, all nations, that's Gentiles. Gentiles means the nations. They're the, the people, Gentiles are the people who make up all the other nations. The Jews are the ones who make up the nation of Israel. But God's already saved and blessed the nation of Israel. Now He's going to gather all the nations of the earth before Him as he sits on the throne of his glory in his second coming when he returns and sits on that throne of David. He says, uh, it says, And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goat. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goat on the left. And he, and, and, so he's going to divide the nations into sheep and goat, and, and the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. 
Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, blessed. Now I have that circled, underlined, and, and a note on there too. <laughs> I got three things under that blessed in my Bible, in case you want to do the same, but listen at least. Then shall the king say unto them on, the, on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ is going to come back and establish his kingdom on this earth. When he does, Israel is his nation, national people that he's going to establish that kingdom with. And once he establishes Israel and blesses Israel, then he divides the nations into sheep and goats. And the sheep nations on his right hand, he says to them, come, be a part of the kingdom. And, and, and he says, the reason they get to come and be a part, he says, for when I was hungered, uh, I was hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. I always say this because it just baffles me. If you were just now invited into the kingdom, wouldn't you just keep your mouth shut and walk into the kingdom? <laughs> the reason I say that is verse, <laughs> verse 37. And they, uh, uh, then shall the righteous answer and say unto him, When saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed me? When saw we thee sick and in prison and came unto thee? When I got hired in at ISI Manufacturing, I had walked in, the place I worked, even when I was pastoring here, but anyhow, when, when I walked in, I walked in the wrong building. I was going to apply for a forklift job. But I had a suit, or not a suit, but a tie on, a nice shirt. I walked in the wrong, they had two buildings. I walked in the wrong building, and the girl said, no, we're not hiring for forklift, but wait a minute, I'll get one of the men from the office, and he, he gets a, a man named Duke, who comes and hires me to be involved with, uh, to run inventory control. I never worked in an office. They said, he says, you know how to read blueprints? I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, I'll teach you. And he gave me a job in the office, and I go in the back, and the people are calling me sir. And I'm, <laughs> it was so unusual, but when he, when he asked me about blueprints and gave me this interview, I says, you realize uh, this is not the job I came to apply for. I don't know how to do any of this. You know, almost talking to myself like I'm not your guy because I'm thinking he's going to give me a job that I'm not going to be able to handle. But he was sure I could handle it, and I, I learned how to do it and enjoyed the job too. So, uh, but, but I think of that here. That, uh, no, you're, you got the wrong people. When did we do all this? And then it says in verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, the least my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Who's the brethren? Yeah, he's got the nations there, but he, standing with him and reigning with him is the nation of Israel. And he says, When you've done it to one of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Now see, people use that all the time in a practical way to try to teach people to do good and and it's a lovely way. I mean, you, you should do good to your brother. But, you know, not every person that you know is a brother in Christ. It's still good to do good. I'm not taking that away. But see, this passage is not, see, when you do something good for someone else, you're doing it for the Lord. He's going to bless you someday. That's not what this passage is about. This passage is about the nations being judged. Remember that promise to Abraham? I'll bless them that bless you. What did he say in verse 34? Then shall the king say on the right hand, Blessed of my father. They're blessed. The nations are blessed. And why are they blessed? Because they blessed Israel. But look at the verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, uh, de uh, on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For, and he goes through the same list, when I was hungry in prison and so forth, you didn't do all these things to me. They're going to say, when didn't we do that to you? And his answer to them, uh, then, then verse 44 says, then shall he answer them, uh, him saying, Lord, uh, when, oh no, that's when they asked that, verse 45, then shall he answer them saying, verily I say unto you, and as much as ye did, did it uh, not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. So you know, there's, there's two ways as you go through that Old Testament. When God separated the nation of Israel out, you could be blessed with the nation of Israel if you sojourn among them, or as we saw last week, you want to be a part of their Passover, you get circumcised and God will treat you as one of the Jews. They call that proselyte. 
But another way the Gentile nations are going to be blessed when Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom is those nations that blessed Israel, they're going to be allowed to go into the kingdom. And then in, once in that kingdom, the Jews are going to be a kingdom of priests and teach the Gentiles the ways of God. Now that they've gotten rid of all their idolatry and have been invited into the kingdom, they're going to learn the things that they missed to learn before. God's going to use the nation of Israel, and through Israel, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So circumcision was real important. Either the way you treated someone circumcised, or you became circumcised so you could be identified as one of them and be the people of God. Come over to Acts chapter 2. This is where the, actually the New Testament begins, the, the promise of, to the nation of Israel about the pouring out of his spirit, which is going to bring about their forgiveness and their kingdom. And, but also it's going to be followed by his judgment, the tribulation, the wrath to come. But in Acts 2, I, I not so much want to study the passage, but in chapter 2 and verse 5, Peter is addressing the people that I want you to see. It's the day of Pentecost, but it says in verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. That is, Jews have been scattered. They come back to Jerusalem because it's the day of Pentecost. That's what they're told to do. We'll eventually study that. But the people that we're talking about here are Jews. And they're going to hear the, the men speak in, in tongues, the, the wonderful works of God. And it names all the places that these Jews were from. And so in verse 9, it starts listing, and, and it's always interesting to look at that list. I, I keep counting up 13, but wonder if there's a, anyhow, a double one where there's actually a 12 division here. But the point is, is, as you're going through the list of where all these people are from, it ends by saying, in verse, the last part of verse 10, it says, And strangers of Rome, strangers means foreigners, because they're from all these places. They're foreign to Jerusalem. But what kind of foreigners are there? Jews and proselytes. So the things that are, that's, the proselyte is a Gentile who got circumcised and adopted the God of Israel as his God and God's going to treat him as part of the nation of Israel. So salvation, when, when Jesus Christ talked to the woman uh, of Samarita, Samarita the, the woman at the well that you know her of, she says, oh, you think that mountain over, you think Jerusalem is a place to worship, we worship in our mountain. Jesus said to her, you don't know what you worship. Salvation is of the Jews. God, salvation is going to be through the nation of Israel and what God's doing with Israel. Forget Samaria or anywhere else. Now, in, in chapter 2, you, you see how God's dealing with the nation of Israel. Look over in chapter 3. And this is where Peter's in the temple. So naturally he's in Jerusalem and he's among the Jewish people. Uh, in case you miss all, he just heals a man. But in verse 12 it says, And when Peter saw it, that is people gathering because he healed this man, uh, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel? And, and so he starts telling them that this man was healed by Jesus Christ who you crucified and God raised him from the dead. But when he talks about them crucifying him, he says in verse 15, concerning Israel, and, and it says, among the things they did, and killed the prince of life, the, the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, uh, whereof we are witnesses. Um, well, let me just drop right down to the end of the chapter. So, Peter's dealing with the nation of Israel. They rejected Christ. God raised them from the dead. He's calling them to repentance. And, and I wanted you to see that he is dealing with the nation of Israel. But look real close at verse 25. Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God having raised up his son, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. See, in Acts chapter 3, Peter is saying that what's taking place here is God's blessings to the nation of Israel and that God is fulfilling all the way back to those verses we read back in Genesis 12 and Genesis 17. That God is going to create a great nation. Well, he has created a nation. But now he's blessing them and is going to make them great and fulfill the covenant that he made to Abraham. In order to do that, he's got to bless Israel first. Why? Because it's through them all the other nations of the earth will be blessed. 
So God is fulfilling that all the way up to Acts chapter 3. That's what God is doing. He's fulfilling that promise. Now, come over to chapter 15 where we ended last week. I told you we jumped way ahead when we closed last week. Now, some things have transpired in the book of Acts. And that is, I'll show you one in just a moment, but Peter, against his own natural will, was divinely instructed to go to a Gentile. And he can't quite figure out why he was supposed to do that. Even before that, a man, Saul of Tarsus, who persecuted the name of Christ, Jesus Christ from heaven revealed himself to him and made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. When you read his, what the Lord said to him in, in Acts chapter 26, it says that on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, I'm going to send you far hence unto the Gentiles. And uh, so you got this Paul being saved to go to become Saul, being saved to become Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter learning that God is now accepting Gentiles because he had this vision and this revelation to go to a man named Cornelius. But when you come, Paul's ministry has been going up north of Israel. But then those Jews that Peter and them were preaching to, the, even the ones who believed in Christ, it says in Acts chapter 15, and certain men which came down from Judea, so they're actually leaving Jerusalem and, and going, we say they're going north, but they're coming down from the mountains of Jerusalem down into uh, uh, to, uh, uh, Antioch in, in uh, Syria. And, he, and it says, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, that is the Gentiles up there in, in Antioch, and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. See, this is an important issue, isn't it? Verse 2, when Paul and Barnabas, now when Jesus Christ saved Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, he gave him a revelation of truth of his message to Gentiles. We have the Bible, the Old Testament, to tell us what God's message to Israel was. And certainly you could say, you Jew, you Gentiles up there in, in Syria, you, you guys aren't even circumcised. There's no way you guys can be saved. But when it says, when, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, don't ever be afraid to argue scripture. Uh, you don't want to ever argue religion and politics, right? So we go around arguing politics, but it's, no, oh, don't ever argue religion. Well, sometimes you need to argue some things out. What's right? What's wrong? Here's Paul and Barnabas. They have no small dissension and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Go ask Peter. Peter will tell you you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. So they do go up there, and it says in verse uh, uh, 6, it says, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter, and when there had been much disputing, now we got Paul and Barnabas arguing with Peter and the twelve apostles and the elders of Jerusalem fighting over whether Gentiles have to be circumcised to be saved. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by circumcision. <laughs> by faith alone, not, no circumcision involved. And Israel's still not blessed of God. The kingdom hasn't come. It's not the time to divide the sheep and the goat nations and bless the nations through Israel. But yet this Gentile got saved, got the Holy Ghost, and God did it, gave it to them all by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Grace, God's gift of eternal life. And it's such a gift to eternal life that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. All that stuff back there in that Old Testament, Gentiles are getting saved apart from that, separate from that. Now, that, that all happens. There's a, a Bible, there's a meeting here, and a... Uh, um, uh, what do you call that? Not a conference. Uh. <laughs> Anyhow, they, they had them all through history. <laughs> Anyhow, there's a meeting, and they're discussing this, and, and, and everybody's coming to the conclusion that no Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. But look why they, why they come to this conclusion. Come to Galatians chapter 2. What you just read there, here the Apostle Paul, here's his version of what 
of that council. Thank you, I got it. <laughs> that count that you know, there's always been church councils where they all argue over doctrine. Well, that was a church council there. Uh, and, and here's Paul's interpretation of what just took place there. In Galatians chapter 2, after years after Paul's conversion and revelation of what he's to go preach among the Gentiles, which, by the way, in chapter Galatians 1, verses 1 and 11, I, just, I shouldn't pass this up. In Galatians 1, 11, it says, Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing this, and he says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me was not after man. Neither was I taught it, neither, uh, uh, neither, neither received, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the message, the good news of salvation that Paul preached to the Gentiles, he didn't learn it even from the Bible. He didn't learn it from men. Jesus Christ gave him a revelation of the truth that he's to go preach to the Gentiles. So, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, he goes to Jerusalem to tell the apostles what that message is. So that matches Acts chapter 15. Verse 3, one of the people he takes with him, he says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Paul actually takes one of those guys and says, You come with me to Jerusalem. And tell this council here that you're saved and you're not circumcised and you know that God has forgiven all your sins. And, and, so, and, and, and everything they said, they could not convince Titus that he had to be circumcised. It says down in verse 6, But those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, maketh no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, the good news of the uncircumcision. God has good news of salvation to us in our uncir us uncircumcised Gentiles. That message was committed to Paul, right? And he says, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now, I want to make sure you understand this. Do you, do you know what the gospel of the circumcision is? It's the good news is that through the, when God's done blessing Israel, it's through Israel all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. That is good news. And the sign of that is circumcision. That God's going to fulfill that promise through Abraham. But God has not yet blessed Israel the way he said he's going to bless them. He stopped his dealings with Israel. In fact, when you read Romans 11, he says they're not his people today. He sent the Apostle Paul out with a message of truth that you Gentiles can be saved apart from the covenant that God made with Abraham, apart from circumcision and the Jewish program that God has, and you can be saved by grace through faith through the finished work of Jesus Christ and stay, remain uncircumcised. That has nothing to do with sal your salvation. So that's the message. That message is committed to Paul. The other message is committed to Peter. Verse 8 says, For he that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, well, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen, and they to the circumcision. You learn in your Bible right now what right division is all about and how important it is for you to realize that up until the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who God made Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, that your hope of salvation was going to be through the nation of Israel and the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and God blessing Israel first, and that through them, either through circumcision or you blessing Israel, you would be saved. But today that's not the message. The message is God has postponed, and, and really the way that I would say this to you, the cross work of Christ is going to be the means by which God can fulfill the Abrahamic covenant, right? He, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that's going to allow Israel to be saved themselves and the kingdom program that God promised to Israel will come in through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So the cross is the means by which the gospel of circumcision is going to be fulfilled. But the cross was so sufficient, so wonderfully sufficient, that God could in the meantime postpone that fulfillment of that promise. He'll fulfill His promise. But He can postpone that, and the message to us Gentiles is today it's not through Israel, it's directly through the cross of Christ. Christ alone. The work of Christ alone. Salvation is through the cross work of Jesus Christ. Watch this. Come to Philippians chapter 1. 
no, chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3. The cross accomplished more than even the prophetic message declared. And that God today is saving apart from the covenant of Israel. I got two, two things happened. I was watching, you know, I, I flip. And I, I don't watch all these Christian programs, but I flip and they catch my attention and five minutes later I'm gone. But there was a guy, and I don't know who he was because I don't know who him, but I know what he was saying because I watch it long enough. He was in some kind of tribal people, and I'm not sure where the tribal people were, but they, they were in full tribal gown. You know, they're primitive. And, and he was going around saying that these people have always practiced Judaism, that they claim their heritage is Jews. That they are tribal Jews. And, 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 and that they practice all the rituals, all everything of Judaism, all through the years. And, and, uh, and, and so he, he was, they couldn't speak English, so he was saying it through a translator. He turned to them and he says, if God would give you any gift, where would you like to go? The land of Israel. Everyone chanted that. Because they're Jews. And then the man turns to the camera and says, for, 35, for a gift of $35... You can help these people fulfill their dream and send the Jews back to the Holy Land. Now that's Christian television. Now if we're under the Abrahamic Covenant, that'd be a wise investment, wouldn't it? Bless them and you'll be blessed of God. And because people think we're under that covenant, that man was going to rake in some dough. Uh, whether it's true or false, I'm not judging that. But I know that that's not the message today. Why would you want to send a Jewish person back to Jerusalem when Jesus Christ says there's coming an abomination of desolation and when the Jews see that, get out of the land? See, he'll bring them back when he's done judging, but until that, till he brings them back, you wouldn't want to be in that land. When they killed the Prince of Life, God is going to pour out wrath. There's going to be judgment on those people. That, and then after that judgment, Jesus Christ comes back and then brings Israel back to that land. And then through the nation of Israel, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Today, God's saving people apart from the nation of Israel. Got a letter from the National Religious Broadcasters because we went there. They sent us this thing. And this is their statement about pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I think of the verse Jesus Christ said, don't think I come to send, give peace, but I come to send a sword. Why would I, if Jesus Christ is saying, I'm not going to give peace to Jerusalem, it's time to judge them, but the people want me to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, who do you think God the Father will hear, his son or me? But see, they don't understand what the program is. Today, the program, God's not dealing with Israel. You're not blessed through the nation of Israel. You're blessed through the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his work on the cross. Philippians uh, chapter 3, look, look, you know, Paul was, for Paul preaching that message... The twelve and, and the other believers, they, they understand that God has turned to the Gentiles and they give Paul the right hand of fellowship and said, you go too, go, go preach it. But the other Jews, oh, they take Paul as a traitor. But the Apostle Paul warns you and me in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. To write the same thing unto you, Philippians chapter 3, to write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but to you it is safe. That's kind of like what I was saying at the beginning. I might be the third time I'm on this issue, but it's safe for me to do this for you. He says, beware of dogs. Now that could be a reference to Gentiles in their idolatry and sinfulness, the worldly lifestyle. Beware of evil workers, that's certainly religious people. Beware of the concision. And the reason he says concision there is circumcision. Is you start out with circle and then like incision. You cut and make a circle. A circle cut. That's what circumcision is. But here he's saying beware of the concision. Be, beware of the cutters. Beware of those religious guys who think that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Beware of that. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Remember that verse back there? This is going to be a sign in the, in the foreskin of your flesh that you're my people. Paul says, we're the circumcision. And by the way, when Stephen stood up to indict Israel, he said, you, uh, you uncircumcised in heart and ears. 
you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Stephen accused Israel, oh, you might be physically circumcised, but you're not circumcised in heart and ears. So there's a spiritual circumcision. That's what Paul's saying we are. We're the ones who believe God's message, and by believing God's message, we worship God in spirit. We rejoice. Our rejoicing is not in Israel. It's not in the prophetic program. It's in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. It's in Christ himself. And have absolutely no confidence in the flesh. What we do in our flesh, there's no salvation. Look at verse 4. Though I might have confidence in the flesh. Now Paul was a Jew. He said, if any man think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. You think you can trust in your flesh? I bet you I've done better than you, he says. Notice the first thing he says. Circumcised the eighth day. <laughs> if you want to brag about your flesh, being you're, you're right before God, I can brag above you. I was circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of, his, uh, the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he's a Hebrew of Hebrew. He's bragging about all that stuff, right? But then he says in verse 6, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church of God, touching the righteousness of the law, blameless. But those things that were gained to me, all those things he just listed, circumcision, being raised in Israel, and all that, all those things that were gained to me, I lost for Christ. Yea, doubtlessly, I count all things but loss. All those religious things, they're all gone. I don't count them at all. You know, when you count something as loss, you know what you count it as? A debt. See, if it's a profit, it's a gain, right? But he says, I count those things lost. Those things are a debt. Those things don't save. Those things will damn you. Yea, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and do count them as but dung, that I might win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. See, it's all of Christ. And us being found in Christ. Not having our own righteousness, uh, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Today, salvation is to us the offer of God's offer of salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's gift to us, we don't trust in anything in the flesh, and we rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we count all religious activities dung that we might win Christ and be found in in Christ, having His righteousness. That's what salvation is. You know, how come of all the churches and all the arguments that go on, how come there's not a church that believes in circumcision today? We, we joke about it. I mean, it was such a big issue here. Paul said, first thing, that doesn't go on anywhere that I know of. We argue about baptism and all kinds of other law things that God gave to Israel, but no one argues about this anymore. Could it be that that is a testimony of early man understanding the dispensation of the grace of God and the gospel of the uncircumcision? And, you know, we call our TV program Forgotten Truths. Because when you rightly divide and realize that God, in this age of grace, began to do something different than what he was doing with the nation of Israel, used the Apostle Paul and revealed to the Apostle Paul our message today that was a secret. And, and when, you, when you explain that to people, they say, oh, that's some kind of new truth. It's not new truth. It's forgotten truth. And one of the testimonies that everyone knew that but forgot about it is I don't know of the church of the circumcision today. You know, Gentiles saying, yes, we must be circumcised to be saved. Let's all practice that. You've been circumcised? All right, you're saved. Now, I don't know anybody talks that way. But you know, if it wasn't for the gospel of grace, there ought to be a church like that. But that isn't the message today. The message today is that the cross of Christ is sufficient to save you from all your sins. God will fulfill his promise to Abraham in the future, but in the meantime, God's message to you, he wants your eyes and your attention on his son and the work of his son and trust in his son to be your savior. And when you do, God saves you from all your sins. Puts you in his son and in his son declares you righteous. And you become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for uh, allowing us to study these things and to see well, there really is a big change that takes place with your calling and commissioning of the Apostle Paul. But the change is our benefit, Father, that for the last couple thousand years you've been calling out of all nations people to be saved by your grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, who not only died to be Israel's Savior, but died to be ours as well. And we thank you that his cross work is sufficient to give us complete eternal salvation through faith in him. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen.